everybody, I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program, One-on-One -on -one with Alan Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, a chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. It's so great to see you again. Hi, and thank you very much for having me, and personal mazel tov to you on your recent engagement. May you have a long, happy life and a great marriage. Uh, the man who you're engaged to is a very, very lucky person. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, now we're going to have to begin the show on an even more exciting note. Let's get started. As you know, for each show, we'll be joined by a special guest. Our last show opened with a question from Steve Leibowitz. This week, we mark 15 years since the infamous Durban Conference, where NGOs perverted the concept of human rights to use as a weapon against Israel. Today, we're honored to have Professor Gerald Steinberg, the founder and president of NGO Monitor. Let's hear what he has to ask. Hi, Alan. It's great to speak to you, and congratulations on this new and important program with ILTV. As you know, for the last 15 years, NGO Monitor has been publishing research and analysis on the influential non-governmental organizations and their funders that claim to advance human rights and humanitarian agendas, the areas you've been working on all your life. For the first time, because of NGO Monitor's work, groups like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, Oxfam, are being held accountable. In this process, we've been in the trenches together a number of times, including, as I remember well, walking out on Iranian President Ahmadinejad in Geneva at the Durban II conference, where we began the pushback against the NGO hijacking of human rights. Our efforts to expose the lack of credibility and double standards have led a growing number of journalists, academics, and policymakers to start to ask questions rather than just accepting NGO claims at face value. With this in mind, I'd like to ask you where this process of speaking truth to power should go from here. As you know, NGO Monitor was a response to the infamous forum at the UN Durban Conference on Racism in 2001. That conference really paved the way for the BDS and lawfare campaigns, which exploit the language of human rights for political warfare. In the upcoming September 26th event at the UN in Geneva, in which you are also participating, we're going to mark 15 years since the Durban Conference. Can you take a look back, as well as forward, and discuss where you think we've made progress and what else needs to be done, not only to defeat BDS, but also to restore the moral integrity and legitimacy of human rights, particularly among the NGO community? Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Steinberg. You have done uh, more than anybody I know to expose some of the NGOs that really are uh, very biased and one-sided against Israel. Um, uh, most recently, we've discovered that George Soros has been funding uh, NGOs that have been very much uh, anti-Israel in its orientation. And of course, you've also proved that the very concept of NGO isn't always accurate. Non-government organizations are often funded by governments that have an agenda uh, against Israel. So, first of all, Yasher Koch, for the great work you do in the interest of truth. Uh, all you do is expose truth, and your organization's credibility is beyond reproach. So, uh, it ain't broke. You have to keep fix. You don't have to keep fixing it. You're doing the right thing. You're doing everything possible, and I think it's very important for you to get contributions from. Uh, folks out there who care about this uh, process. You know, the very label NGO carries with it a lot of credibility. People think non-governmental organizations, wow, and they associate it with the do-gooders. But many of the NGOs are uh, radical, hard-left organizations. Obviously, some are also radical, hard-right organizations. We're seeing the emergence of that all over Eastern Europe today. But the focus has mostly been on very anti-Israel, very anti-Zionist uh, uh, organizations, often funded by governments, uh, often funded by very, very wealthy people. Um, I think we're winning the fight um, uh, in many areas. We're not winning it on college campuses. And if I had one uh, push that I would make, and that is to have the um, uh, NGO monitor uh, increase its presence on college and university campuses where NGOs have increasing influence and increasing credibility 
And all we're interested in is truth. I know you sometimes are criticized, your organization is criticized because they say you're attacking NGOs, but your currency is emet, veritas, truth. And what you do is add a dimension of reality to what is often a very unreal, unbalanced, and untrue attack on Israel. So keep up your great work. You can always count on me to work with you. And um, you're right about Durban. Durban was an abuse of human rights. And, you know, for people like us who've devoted our life to human rights, to see human rights become human wrongs and to see human rights become a weapon against countries that practice human rights like Israel and the United States is such a distortion that we have to do everything in our power to keep the focus on truth. So thanks again for your great work. Thanks for your response, Professor. Now, we're going to be speaking about the BDS movement, especially when it comes to college campuses later on. Uh, but now let's turn to our viewers' questions. We open with a topic that made front page on almost every Israeli newspaper this week, Israel hosting a delegation from the International Criminal Court. Let's hear from David Benjamin, who hails from the United States. Professor Dershowitz, according to press reports, Israeli authorities are cooperating to some extent with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, in its investigation of Israeli forces. As you know, the ICC chief prosecutor, who is not supposed to be influenced by political considerations, decided to recognize a state of Palestine capable of joining the ICC, which I think, from a legal point of view, is a highly questionable decision. On this basis, the prosecutor now claims to have jurisdiction over acts carried out in the territory of that state by Israelis, despite the fact that Israel, like the US, is not a member of the ICC. Now, be that as it may, I would expect the ICC to very quickly reach the conclusion that it has no business investigating Israelis, because, and this I have from personal knowledge, Israel has a robustly independent mechanism for investigating itself. And of course, under international law, in such a case, the international tribunal has no business uh, dealing with such a country. My question to you is whether you feel the ICC can be relied upon to be impartial in relation to Israel. Thank you. That's a great question, David. I would like to turn it around and say this. Uh, it's not Israel who will be on trial if the ICC finds jurisdiction. It will be the ICC that will be on trial. Uh, the International Criminal Court will fail if it goes after Israel because it will lead countries like the United States to say, this is a court without credibility. Um, if this court, which has as part of its charter a notion that you can't go after a country if it has its own mechanism for dealing with potential uh, crimes and war crimes, uh, if it doesn't recognize that Israel has that potential, it won't recognize it for the United States or other countries as well, and it will be the end of the International Criminal Court's credibility. Uh, the International Criminal Court ultimately will only succeed if the United States and Israel join. You may know that Israel actually wanted to join, but because the United States decided not to join, Israel decided not to join as well. My hope is that someday both the United States and Israel can join. I spent a lot of time talking to the first prosecutor, uh, Louis Ocampo, who is a great, great prosecutor and a great man, and he was very interested in trying to um, persuade the United States and Israel to join. And I had great faith in him as the prosecutor. I remain to be shown that the current prosecutor has that same kind of um, objectivity. I think it was the wrong decision to recognize Palestine as an entity because that just encourages the Palestinians to refuse to sit down and make the kinds of compromise two-state solution that everybody understands is the only possible realistic resolution to the conflict in the Middle East. And so I think the ICC has made it harder for the Palestinians to come and negotiate uh, peace because they've recognized them without any need to negotiate. So this is going to be a great test for the ICC. I approve of Israel's decision to welcome ICC investigators. Israel has nothing to hide. Uh, it has a, an extremely active a judicial system, both within the military and outside the military. Israel is one of the few countries in the world where the lawyers, the Judge Advocate General Corps, has a final say in whether or not certain actions can be engaged in by the military. 
That's unique even in the United States. The Judge Advocate Corps has influence, but the commanders have the final say. So Israel stands above virtually every other country that is in the Rome Treaty and members of the ICC, and it will be very interesting. We ought to watch with great care to see whether the ICC passes its own test. If it fails over Israel-Palestine, it will be the fault of the ICC, and that will be a great tragedy. If it succeeds, then it may open the door to the United States and Israel ultimately becoming members. Thanks for your response, Professor. And now to a question from our younger audience. The school year is about to begin for American colleges, and Charlotte Korchak from California is preparing in her own way. Let's hear what's on her mind. Hi, I'm Charlotte from California. Hi, Alan. Um, I would love to know, you know, we're starting school. Uh, what are we going to face on college campuses this coming year when it comes to Israel? And for those of us who care about Israel and love Israel, uh, what can we do to help fight the fight uh, for Israel on college campuses? Thanks. Charlotte, great question. And you're going to be fighting very difficult situation. Uh, we're going to see on college campuses a double standard. We're going to see political correctness, trigger warnings, microaggressions, safe spaces applied only to anti-Israel uh, groups, not to pro-Israel groups. Um, Jewish supporters of Israel don't have safe spaces on campus. They're not given trigger warnings. One of the University of California colleges is now sponsoring a course on why Israel shouldn't exist, requiring the students to go to uh, a pro-Palestine, anti-Israel demonstration on campus as part of um, the curriculum. And there are no trigger warnings in that class. I've read the curriculum in the class. It's all biased. It's all anti-Israel uh, propaganda. There's almost no academic books that are uh, described in the class. And that's going on all over the country. So it's completely one-sided. All the protections that are afforded to women, to blacks, to gays, to Latinos, to Asians, and to others, Jews are excluded. There's this phony concept called intersectionality, which you'll hear about on your college campus, which says all oppression uh, is essentially the same. And the same people that oppress gays oppress Palestinians. And it's always the Zionists, the capitalists, the uh, colonialists, the imperialists, and it's always Israel, the Zionists, and the United States that are the villains. The Jews are not included within intersectionality. It's as if Jews aren't oppressed anywhere in the world. Um, Jews are still among the most oppressed minorities, not only in the world, but there are more anti-Semitic incidents in the United States, in France, in Great Britain, in other Western countries than uh, any other kinds of uh, antagonism toward groups, and yet Jews are excluded. So you're going to have to develop a thick skin. You're going to have to fight back. Uh, you may suffer some grade reduction when you stand up against this kind of bigotry in your classroom, but it's worth it. Uh, and you should do that. Uh, you should always seek the support of sympathetic faculty members or outside groups like the Anti-Defamation League, like CAMERA, like Stand With Us, like NGO Monitor. Uh, don't be hesitant to seek outside help. Call me. I'm available to fight this fight with you on college campuses. But most important, do not remain silent. Do not give up. Do not give in. You can compromise, you can sit down and talk to uh, other groups. By the way, they don't want to talk to you. Uh, the um, BDS movement excludes people like you and me because we're pro-Israel. And if you're pro-Israel, you're part of who should be boycotted. So it's important to demand a single standard and objectivity of universities. Don't hesitate to go to your alumni base. They will be more supportive sometimes than the hard left faculty that will be very supportive of anti-Israel groups. So the most important thing is this is great training to teach you how to fight back in the real world, because the real world has turned in many instances very much against Israel, and colleges are an extraordinary training ground to get your values in order and to get you to be more articulate in defense of Israel. So let's turn this to our advantage. Let's learn how to fight back. Let's learn how to defend Israel. And never forget that we have the most important weapon on our side, truth. All we care about truth. All we want is nuance in the conversation, balance, uh, uh, opportunity to present our side. Um, never be fearful of criticizing Israel, or Israel deserves to be criticized. But always put it in context. 
always make it comparative and always understand that the truth is on our side. We have nothing to hide. So fight back, fight back strongly and fight back with the conviction that we are right. It's an important message. Now, talking about U.S. colleges, we know, as we've just heard, that you're very outspoken about current day education methods, especially in prestigious American universities. In the age of political correctness, it seems like faculty are not challenging their students to be more open-minded about political issues like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or race relations. What needs to change on college campuses? Everything. Everything needs to change on college campuses. You cannot have a reasonable, nuanced discussion about Israel-Palestine, about uh, Black Lives Matter, about sexual assaults on campus. You cannot have a nuanced conversation. You have to take sides. And the sides have to be stark. They have to be, are you for it or you're against it? And classroom discussion has become stilted and difficult. Students are afraid to express their views. More and more faculty members are saying we're not going to allow tape recordings in the classroom because they're terrified that the tape recordings will capture their bigotry. I think there is, in my view, a constitutional right uh, of a student to tape record public lectures by public teachers at public universities or even private universities. And I think there should be a movement to, to permit the recording of lectures. Um, I don't think it will stifle free speech but I think it will promote truth and promote nuance. And when alumni hear what is being taught in some classrooms, they will be absolutely shocked. Look, the role of a university is not to teach you what to think. It's to teach you how to think. Um, you know, in 50 years of teaching at Harvard, students had no idea what my personal views were because I didn't bring them into the classroom. I sometimes brought personal views as a devil's advocate. I would take positions that I don't believe in. For example, I would make the argument in favor of the death penalty because no one else in the class was making that argument. Or I would make arguments in favor of other politically unpopular causes. But the role of the teacher is not to propagandize. The role of the teacher is not to inflict her views or his views on students. The role of the teacher is to help students think through their own values, think through their own philosophies, make them better thinkers, make them more articulate, make them better writers make them able to deal with the realities of what we're going to face in a real world. So I am appalled at what goes on in many colleges and universities. Having said that, let me make one other point. In 50 years of teaching, there are some exceptions to this, obviously. There are some teachers with courage. But I have never met a group of less courageous individuals than tenured full professors at major universities. They are terrified about speaking out. They are terrified about offending students. They're terrified about having their evaluations lowered. They're terrified about getting criticized by students or by uh, deans. And tenure is supposed to be a guarantee that you can speak your voice. And too few professors are prepared to express views that are politically incorrect, particularly views that are supportive of Israel today on college campuses. Well, I can tell you about a lot of uh, crazy experiences that I had while going to college in the U.S., not far from what you're mentioning. Now, By the way, the same problem exists in Israel. Uh, there is political correctness on university campuses in Israel, too. And um, many, many hard left professors want to be able to express their views without being criticized. I made a speech at Tel Aviv University a few years ago where I defended the right of speakers, even those who are advocating BDS, to speak. But I also defended the right of people who are critical of them to criticize them. And um, I got criticized. They called me a McCarthyite because I said you can criticize Israeli professors on the hard left for making statements that were unjustified and not based in truth. So the problem exists in Israel as well as in the United States. It's far worse in France. It's far worse in England. It's far worse in other parts of the world. Obviously, academic freedom doesn't exist in uh, any part of the Arab and Muslim world today. It doesn't exist in Turkey. It doesn't exist uh, in almost any part of the Arab and Muslim world. But uh, we need more of it, more academic freedom in Israel and in the United States. I agree with you on that one. Now, turning to another topic, November is just around the corner, and it seems like the American elections are on everyone's mind. Our viewers are struggling with who they'll vote for from both sides of the political spectrum. Steve Missler from St. Louis, Missouri, wants to ask about the Democratic Party. I'm Steve Missler from St. Louis, Missouri. 
Given that Iran will have resources in terms of cash and weapons at its disposal to murder Israelis worldwide, and that Hillary and her running mate follow the same anti-Israel Palestinian false narrative, how can you justify a vote for the Democratic ticket, given its indirect toll on Israel and Jewish lives that will be extinguished, resulting from the spoiled fruit of the Democratic platform on these issues? Well, it's a good question. Um, as you know, I was strongly opposed to the Iran deal. I remain opposed to the Iran deal. I think it was a mistake. And I think that whoever is elected president ought to make sure it's enforced uh, to the hilt. It will not be abrogated. We don't abrogate uh, these kinds of arrangements. It was also improperly processed in the United States under our Constitution. It should have been a treaty. It should have required a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Instead, there wasn't even a vote of the Senate allowed. Uh, so I was very much opposed uh, uh, to that. The reason I remain a Democrat is because the Democrats are a very important party. They may very well win this election. The polls show that they probably win, will win this election. And I don't want to see uh, any uh, election become a referendum over Israel. I want to make sure that Israel remains a bipartisan issue. So I will remain a Democrat. I will fight within the Democratic Party. I will try my best to influence the decisions of whoever is the next uh, president. And if she's a Democrat, um, I will have her ear more than I would have the ear of a Republican. And uh, it's likely that if the Democrats win, they will win with the support of a majority, perhaps not an overwhelming majority, but a majority of the pro-Israel and Jewish a vote in the United States. And we are an important constituency. We matter in states like Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, swing states. And so I think it's important for Israel always to remain a bipartisan um, issue. I could never support a candidate who was opposed to Israel. And I don't believe that either Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton were opposed to Israel. Uh, both support Israel's right to defend itself. Uh, the Obama administration was strongly opposed to the Goldstone Report, strongly supported Israel's efforts in the Gaza wars to defend itself, maintained Israel's qualitative military superiority, helped Israel build Iron Dome. The hard left, uh, for example, the National Lawyers Guild, which is a hard left, very anti-Israel organization, filed a brief saying that the United States was guilty of genocide for helping Israel build the Iron Dome. That's a new definition of genocide. A defensive weapon designed to protect Israeli civilians from rocket attacks is now a weapon of genocide. The hard left has become absurd on this issue. We have to fight it. And my job as a liberal Democrat is to marginalize the hard left, to make sure that people like Sanders and Jill Stein, who's now running on the uh, ticket of the Green Party, and people like Cornell West, uh, who are anti-Israel, are marginalized within the Democratic Party. So because the Democratic Party is a major institution in the United States and probably will be in the White House, maybe control the Senate and the House, it's very important that liberal Jews like me remain within the Democratic Party to fight within that structure and not abandon the Democratic Party only to anti-Israel zealots. That would be a terrible, terrible mistake, both tactically and morally. So I will remain a Democrat, and I will fight hard within the Democratic Party to maintain its pro-Israel perspective. Thanks, Professor. Now, as per usual, we're not done with the U.S. elections, only this time our viewer is questioning the Republican Party, and he happens to be a former law student of yours. Let's hear from Owen Alterman, who hails from Detroit but currently works as a journalist in Israel. Professor Dershowitz, good morning from Israel. A lot of American Jews have voiced concern over the rise of the alt-right, the emerging far-right movement that has racist and anti-Semitic currents in it. And they're especially concerned about the rise of this movement in the context of the 2016 campaign. How worried are you? And second, a lot of Jewish supporters of Donald Trump say they're willing to support Trump despite the fact that he's supported by people from the alt-right. They say that Trump shouldn't be tainted by the views of his supporters, that he can't control who supports them, and they're more concerned about what they see as Trump's positions on Israel and other issues which they see as favorable. How persuasive do you think this argument is? Do you think the Jews who otherwise would support Donald Trump should not do so because of the connections of the alt-right with him and his campaign? Thank you. Oh, and it's great to hear from you. You were a great, great student and a very important person at the Harvard Law School with your uh, pro-Israel advocacy and your excellent record as a law student. I'm delighted that you're continuing your career in journalism in Israel. And your question, as usual, is <coughs> excuse me, very, very perceptive. Um, 
look, I, I agree with Donald Trump that he can't decide who supports him, but I do worry that he has not disassociated himself as strongly and as quickly as he might have from some of the uh, hard right and anti-Semitic groups. Um, there was an article, I thought an unfair article, by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times listing all the groups, the terrible groups that support um, Donald Trump, the American Nazi Party, uh, all these fascist groups, uh, ISIS, etc. You know, you could make the same argument about Hillary Clinton. There are some pretty terrible people that support her as well, people on the hard left, people who are very anti-Israel. Um, Many of the J Street people support uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. I don't think you judge a candidate by who supports them, but you judge a candidate by who they support. Um, I'm worried about Donald Trump for really a different reason, and that is I think he's a destabilizing force at a time when we need stability in the world. We're seeing increased instability in many parts of Europe, Eastern Europe, instability with the hard right uh, taking over countries like uh, Poland and, and Slovakia and Hungary and uh, perhaps Austria. Uh, we're seeing the hard left growing in influence in the British Labour Party with its uh, tint of anti-Semitism, as well as in some parts of uh, France. What we need is a stabilizing centrist president, and I think Hillary Clinton is that person. I don't think Donald Trump is that person. I don't know what Donald Trump's views are, are in Israel. I've heard very uh, conflicting views. One, he wants to have a more balanced approach to the Palestinians because he wants to be a fair negotiator. Uh, but two, he says he would never abandon Israel. I suspect that both candidates will be strong on Israel. I suspect that I'll disagree with both candidates on some elements of their Israel policy. And uh, I've just written a book um, called Electile Dysfunction, um, a guide for unaroused voters, in which I write a book about people who are dissatisfied with either candidate. And in it, I have a checklist of the 10 points that I look to before I decide who to vote for for uh, president. Uh, you can get the book on Kindle. Uh, and you can compare your checklist to my checklist. Um, um, I'm disappointed with some of the things Trump has said, generalizing about Muslims, generalizing about Mexicans, attacking the mother and father of a heroic American Muslim soldier who saved the lives of his compatriots. Um, I'm upset about a lot of things that Donald Trump has done. I'm also not happy about some things that uh, the other candidates uh, have done. So uh, one has to make a balanced uh, decision on this. And on balance, I do think that uh, Hillary Clinton will be best for the world, best for America, and ultimately best for Israel, because I think Israel thrives in a, in a climate of stability. And I think Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, and the Jewish people in general, suffer from instability. We suffer when extremes have too much power, whether extremes of the right or extremes of the left. An essay was written after the Second World War called between the black and the red, how Jews have always suffered under the black of fascism and the red of communism, and how we thrive in centrist economies, centrist political systems. And I think Hillary Clinton is more likely to strengthen that center. Tony Blair has written about the need to strengthen the center, and I agree with that. So I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton, but I understand voters who vote for Donald Trump. And I don't think your vote should be influenced uh, largely by who supports Donald Trump, but rather by what Donald Trump himself says or does. All right, Professor, that's all the time we have for your questions today. Uh, I also want to thank all of our guests, especially Professor Gerald Steinberg and your former student, Owen Alterman. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, go to ILTV.TV or our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Alan. Thank you.